GOP congressmen lay low. John Kasich, not so much. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Jackie Borchard, State House reporter for Cleveland.com. Chrissy Thompson, State House reporter for the Cincinnati Inquirer. Dale Butler, Democratic strategist. And Mike Gonadakis, Republican strategist. Politicians usually are not ones to avoid crowds. The more faces, the more hands to shake, the better. Not so much this winter, at least for Republican members of Congress. Local members of Congress are avoiding big crowds town meetings to be specific because members that do hold them are getting a lot of questions and criticism from people who want to keep Obamacare. Pat T. Berry and Steve Stivers are choosing private small meetings and telephone town halls. Congressman Jim Jordan, never one to shy away from conflict, is openly engaging with opponents like he did this week in Marion and in Toledo. Talking about why do you want to get rid of the APA? Why not make it stronger and more forceful and make this a healthy environment for our children and grandchildren? I said, I think no, that money is your issue. New leadership, it might be better than what we've had. I haven't heard that from your president. Oh, I have not heard that. Jackie Borchard, I mean, Jim Jordan did it. He came out looking pretty good because he engaged with these folks. Why are the others who are in equally safe districts like Pat T. Berry and Steve Sivers unwilling to, to meet these folks? Well, I mean, it, that and that moment that we just saw was, like you said, it was a pretty calm moment, but others have been not as calm. And, and when you have a town hall meeting, uh, that was a much smaller group of people than some of these other congressmen and senators are facing in their states. I think uh, Tom Cotton held one uh, this week that, that clips are circulating. And I think that's the big fear is that you're going to get a, a, cringe, a cringeworthy YouTube moment that just kind of lives on and, and makes you look bad. And, and that's hard. Um, it, it is interesting that uh, that uh, Jim Jordan did go out in, into the field because we've seen that the other reps in Ohio haven't, and it'll be interesting to see if they come to follow his lead or, or decide to, to stay out. It's obviously a risk-benefit, Chrissy. The, the risk is a, is a YouTube moment, like Jackie mentioned. The benefit is you, you can look better if you are engaging with folks who you, you disagree with. Yeah, you know, there's a risk to staying home, too. Yeah. You uh, uh, look um, like you have something to hide, maybe that you're um, nervous or, or, or afraid. Um, and uh, I, I think reporters are always on the side of come out and talk to the people, right? I mm -hmm. mean, that's, that's, that's what we do. Um, but I think, uh, I, I, you know, I heard Jim Jordan defending himself on, um, on, on NPR this week, and and, and talking about his comments, and, and I, I agree with Jackie, he, it, he, looked, he looked good, it, it, came, it came off well for him, so, so why not engage with the public and why not answer the, the questions? Um, whatever happens is going to be very public yeah. and, and these folks are gonna be accountable for it, so, so why not uh, start talking about it now? You know, my, my friend Jim Jordan had it a little bit easy, you know, in, in his neck of the woods with that clip you just showed. But, you know, if you're going to have adults acting like children, or I wouldn't blame any Democrat or Republican for not wanting to be in a room with a bunch of jackasses. If you want to sit down like an adult and have a conversation about health care, let's do that. But, but the screaming, thing, yeah. yeah. But this was payback from 2009 when the very same, same, same thing was happening exactly. to Democrats, no? I 100% yeah. agree. And, yeah. and no Democrat should have been subjected to that in 2009, 2010, and no Republican should be subjected to that today. Mm -hmm. Look, we have serious issues with health care. Let's sit down as adults and talk about them because the silent majority is looking at this and saying no thank you this is why we voted for Trump. Yeah, so let me make a couple of points uh, maybe Mike can answer this for us I thought Republicans I thought you guys were tough guys I thought you guys were the ones who were going to obliterate ISIS but now we find out that you need safe spaces and trigger warnings to protect against the microaggressions of the people that you're representing this is ridiculous you know lots of times democracy is messy and it's loud but that's what it sounds like. And as for health care, let me say, the reason these people are upset, and these things are not just happening, by the way, in blue states. This is happening in, in deep red states like Utah and Montana and Arkansas. People are scared, particularly the 20 million people that have health insurance now through Obamacare and who are in danger of losing it if the Republicans repeal it without an adequate replacement. And if you think these things are raucous, you just wait until the Republicans start trying to cut back on Social Security or privatize Medicare. They're going to come out of the woodwork. Mike, isn't, isn't the loudness of these meetings just indicative that 
perhaps Republicans have underestimated how many folks support the Affordable Care Act, at least parts of it. No, because uh, we know for a fact that there are millions of people that do support it and some bother to show up at these hearings but or at these town halls. But Mike, keep in mind, every poll demonstrates that one of the top five reasons people voted for Trump was because they wanted a better health care system and not Obamacare. So while the rest of us are at home or at work or with our family, a loud vocal minority is showing up. But, but at, at, at the end of the day, keep in mind that Donald Trump said he's going to repeal it. He's only been on the job for, what, 40 days now? Let's give him a little bit of a chance. Maybe if the Democrats weren't obstructing all of his nominees <laughs> and actually appointing them, we could get this. <laughs> Done. What, what, what You've had that? seven years, Mike, and you still don't have a replacement well, for Ob Obamacare. Ob Obama <laughs> well, Jackie, <laughs> last time I checked, he was president. The, the Associated Press today pointed out that some Democrats in tough races are not holding town halls. Claire McCaskill from Missouri, Sherrod Brown from Ohio. Mm -hmm. They are facing tough races. They haven't held town hall meetings this, this week during the recess. Right. Uh, you, you know, it's a no one wants to walk into a mob environment yep. and I think that that's kind of that's what you're seeing in some some of these clips that are being highlighted and you know to say though that you're going to replace that that public face-to-face -face time with your constituents with a small private meeting you know with this with a handful of constituents or a telephone ho town hall is not the same thing um, because both of those things you can screen who comes in and uh, and who gets to ask questions yeah, let, let me just say on that, <coughs> it is ridiculous to say that these tele-town hall meetings, when you do stuff over the telephone, these are just sanitized incumbent protection efforts. These guys can and do screen calls to make sure that only friendly questioners get in. They can hit the mute button if things start to get out of control. I think that every member of Congress, if they want to represent the people, they have a duty to go out and meet with them. And if it gets loud, if some of these people are upset or angry, then that's part of the democratic process. It, 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 you see if the, if the congressperson had set up the town meeting, but a lot of these meetings, Chrissy, were set up by, by activists. Whether you, I mean, either mm. you know, grassroots, like the indivisible uh, yeah, group sure. that's sort of come up since the Trump election. So you can understand not going wanting to go to those. But the, then they didn't set up the one on their own. To, to begin with. Yeah, Jim Bernacy actually said um, basically that he didn't feel like those groups had tried hard enough to work with his schedule to set up something that he actually could come to. Um, and you could, you can, um, you know, the groups disagreed. You can parse what it really means to, to work on that. But um, but uh, honestly, uh, you, you want to set up your, your uh, own town hall that you don't think has a, a mob environment? Well, uh, do it. You know, a lot of these folks didn't. So, yeah. Um, you know, uh, they, they have been having smallish, uh, you know, 50, 20 to 50 people meetings, uh, which they prefer. Okay, that's fine. A lot of folks want to have more access to you, and I'm sure those folks would have shown up at other town halls. We're going to get to our next topic. The last time, at last year at this time, John Kasich was holding lots of town hall meetings when he was running for president. This year, no town halls, but many wonder if he is still running for president. In 2020, Kasich ended his week in Washington where he met with Donald Trump at the White House. Earlier in the week, he was in Germany and in England talking with foreign government and business leaders. He took time out to appear on CNN and offer some helpful advice to the new president. What they're saying is we can hear from the vice president, we can hear from General Mattis, we can hear from General Kelly, but we're not sure about the president. And uh, it is vital that the administration be on the same page. And there is question that in a time of crisis, where will America be? Chrissy Thompson sounds more like a presidential candidate than the governor of Ohio there. I mean, he was asked the question, what are leaders telling you? So to be fair, he wasn't just making a speech. He was answering a question. But what do you make of this tour? Um, well, I think that it's fair to say that in all things we're going to see from John Kasich for the next couple of years, he's keeping his options open. I still think it's pretty unlikely that he would um, primary a sitting Republican president. Um, I don't, I, there are some thoughts out there that one doesn't really know what's going to happen with Donald Trump's presidency and, and that uh, why does it hurt the governor to, you know, put the book out and do the, do the tours. Um, he also really enjoyed some of these travels and, and higher profile that he had during his presidential campaign and part of this is just this is what he wants to do. He wants to be an elder statesman in the Republican Party. Jackie met with Donald Trump on Friday um, basically to push for Medicaid expansion or, or some form of a Medicaid expansion which he did in Ohio. That was the primary reason probably for the meeting and as they look to replace, repeal, repair Obamacare. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Now we're also hearing instead of repeal and replace, repeal and repair from, from Jim Renacci said that this week. But um, yeah, so Donald Trump invited Republican governors, those from states that decided to expand Medicaid and those that didn't uh, to, to kind of 
try to get around that issue of what to do with that piece of the Affordable Care Act. And of course, you know, Governor Kasich has not shied away from his decision. He's in to uh, expand me Medicaid. He's embraced it. It's become part of what you could consider to be his legacy uh, as Ohio governor. He's very proud of, of the work that that has done. And so he is naturally protective of it. And he's said all along that he plans to, you know, go to Washington, do whatever it takes to, to make sure that Ohio's experience is, is reflected in what they decide to do. Does, does Trump listen to him? I mean, he, he, he overthrew his party chair here in Ohio, seems to have a bit of a grudge. Well, well, look, both both <coughs> men, Kasich and, and President Trump, um, um, are not going to change who they are, um, and, and they're going to do what they believe is right. But I think the president did the right thing by bringing in a voice. In Ohio, Medicaid expansion is working. Governor Kasich has saved billions of dollars by doing it, too. So I think he needs to – it's an important voice to have around the table when we decide what to do. with me Medicaid expansion, Affordable Care Act, as Jackie pointed out, are two separate things. We can keep Medicaid expansion, and we can get rid of Obamacare and fix it. Yeah, well, of course, Med – Medicaid expansion was a huge part of Obamacare, and I suspect that uh, Jackie's right. I'm sure Kasich went there and he said, look, if you repeal Medicaid expansion, it's going to be really hard on 700,000 poor people in the state of Ohio, and it will blow a huge hole, by the way, in Governor Kasich's budget, uh, too. But unlike Mike, uh, Governor Kasich never did jump on the, case, uh, on the Trump bandwagon. He never endorsed him. He publicly re refused to vote for him and hasn't met with him since he was inaugurated over a month ago. So I, I find it hard to believe he got much of a sympathetic ear out of Donald Trump. Does he, does he, I mean, it's not unheard of for a sitting president to be, have face a primary challenge with Jimmy Carter, face Ted Kennedy, uh, Pat Buchanan took on George H.W. Bush. There have been times where the sitting president, if he's un, un, been unpopular, would, would run. You know, the, the story that we heard over and over and over again, you know how John Kasich got his start in politics was helping Ronald Reagan take on Gerald Ford. So never say never. I heard that story, at, I don't know, 25, 50 times <laughs> <Yeah>. in the <laughs> past, <laughs> past couple of years. So what, what always tends to happen is when a sitting president gets challenged in a primary, it usually does not turn out well for the sitting president in the next election. Um, and But if Trump craters as uh, president, there's no doubt that Kasich going to Munich gives him a chance to burnish his, you know, his uh, uh, cred in terms of foreign policy mm -hmm. and uh, g also gave him a platform to, uh, to criticize Trump for what he called his loose words and his undercutting of NATO. Let's be clear. The Germany trip was about job creation. This, John Kasich only went twice during his seven years as governor overseas on, on, on job trips. In this one, he met with German companies. We have a huge investment by German companies in job creation in Ohio. He did the same thing in London. So this is only his, only his second trip outside of Ohio for such a trade mission. So let's give the man credit. He's doing his job. I know Democrats like to use that hashtag, do your job. Well, John Kasich's doing his job. But with Trump's approval rating in the, the high 30s right now, the chances of a possibly a GOP primary challenge are, are pretty good, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say, no. if, they, if these hold? No, I, I, I don't see it. I don't see it. Uh, I think Donald Trump was going to do just fine. And, uh, you know, let's worry about right the here and now. Not, well, four years will take care of itself, but um, I don't see it. Well, Mike, but your question was, if these numbers hold, if Trump is still in the 30s, four years from now, you're going to see Republicans both in the Senate, in the Congress, and everywhere else running for, the li running for their lives and running for the hills. And I wouldn't be surprised to see Trump get taken on by at least one other person if his numbers are still Every, in the 30s. Everyone counts out Donald Trump and he just keeps on winning. I, I honestly think it just kind of depends on who the Democrats put up and, uh, you know, what the tenor in the country is. We were very surprised by this last election result. Let's not forget that. Okay. The field of Republican candidates looking to succeed John Kasich is taking shape. It's a little crowded at the moment. Attorney General Mike DeWine has said he would like to be governor, as has Secretary of State John Husted. Lieutenant Governor Mary Taylor this week formed her fundraising committee, so she's off and running, at least preliminarily. And Congressman Jim Renese of the Akron area says the executive branch of government intrigues him. On the Democratic side, we are still waiting for clear indication that someone wants to be governor. To the Republicans, <laughs> Mike Gonadakis, all four of those folks got to run, do you think? be on the primary ballot a year from now? Full disclosure, all four of those people are personal friends of mine, so I wish them all the best of luck. But uh, Pick one. No, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, not not going to happen. Um, you know, it's the funny thing is filing deadline in 2018 usually uh, takes care of at least one or two, and I predict there will probably be a 
two-person race as opposed to a four-person race. Who that is? Well, it remains to be seen. But the exciting thing is, is look at these four terrific candidates we have that are all well-funded versus what you see on the Democrat side. No candidates, no money, all right, no two. organization. Pick the two. If you had to put it, which two would you pick? Uh, it's too I don't difficult. want to hurt any friendships here. No, right? I don't want to hurt any friendships either. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, conventional wisdom would say Mike DeWine has a clear shot to be one of them. Um, he's got the name recognition and the money, but uh, the other one I think is, is wide open. Mary Taylor, Lieutenant Governor Chrissy of a, of a fairly popular governor, she would seem to be, you know, next in line. Yeah, you know, uh, the thing with Mary Taylor is that she um, hasn't been laser focused on this. She's kind of thought this might be her next step, um, but she is a formidable uh, candidate. I think we ha uh, can't forget that. She was the only Republican elected statewide in 2006. Um, she is a, a leading Republican woman, um, which is um, a, a really important thing in, in the party in the state. And uh, John Kasich has said, you know, no drama, I will be endorsing her, even though some of his, um, his operatives are, are helping other folks. So uh, I, think she, I think she has a more, she actually has name ID too, that, that uh, I think pretty higher than anybody except for Mike DeWine, which is pretty impressive. So uh, don't count her out, but she uh, has been a lieutenant governor and doesn't have her own money. You know, she set up a, a PAC basically that raised uh, close to a million dollars in the past couple of months, but, but uh, the reason she's put her name out so uh, early is because she needs to catch up. Right, she needs to file this week. That's when she filed her official campaign fundraising committee mm -hmm. where, uh, you know, John Hewson and Mike DeWine have had the benefit of being able to raise that money continually while they have held state office. And like uh, Chrissy said, I think, um, you know, Mary Taylor has had a lot more visibility since uh, Governor Kasich began running for president. She took over a lot of, you know, the ribbon cutting duties and, and traveling across the state to to various uh, rotary meetings and such. And so uh, she has been out and about and around the state and uh, just as much, if not more, than uh, John Houston and Mike DeWine. Her the fierce critic of, of the Affordable Care Act has been from the, from the very get-go. Right, and she has the support of the new um, Ohio Republican Party chairwoman, mm -hmm. Jane Timken. Mary Taylor's biggest problem is money. Uh, Mike DeWine and John Houston both have two and a half million dollars each. Jim Renancy is a independently wealthy person, so he can finance his own race. Mary Taylor doesn't have any money, and historically, she she's not been especially good at raising it. She, her, her family is independently wealthy. I think it's important to say, but but um, but her campaign uh, committee doesn't. Have right money. now, she has zero in the bank. They have two and a half million dollars. That is a big head start. I personally think that her best shot would be if she is the only woman candidate in a three-person field or mm. uh, because maybe then she could pull off what Democratic uh, Treasurer Mary Ellen Withrow did in the 80s when she was the only woman in a three-person field and she hoovered up the women's votes and the men split the male votes and she ended up winning. Well, Mary and Taylor and might and do the and same And not thing. even talking gender, I mean, right now it looks like people who, who their life's goal is to be in this race are, are Mike DeWine and John Houston, and if they attack the heck out of each other, she certainly could just rise. There's no, there's no outsider in this race, really, right now, Mike. I mean, you could say Congressman Renacci is the lesser known, could yeah. run as an outsider to state government, but. Yep. There's no Trump-like candidate in this race. There's no wild card, someone who's going to bring change if that voters still want change two years from now. I think that closest one would be Jim Renacci. And, you know, let's keep in mind that he's going to have a good story to tell. But the more people in the race, it helps Mike DeWine the most because of his strong name ID and his network and his, and his uh, ability to raise money. So if you have four people in it, it's guaranteed going to be Mike DeWine. You have three people in there, guaranteed Mike DeWine's going to win. The, the best chance to knock off Mike DeWine is going to be a head-to-head -head matchup. But at the end of the day, they're all going to be financed. They're all going to have the resources. And notice what we haven't talked about. The Democrats. We'll get into that. Okay. <laughs> Dale, there's the, nothing there. We keep hearing that Tim Ryan is close to making a decision. Another week has passed where he hasn't made a decision, at least as of re as the time we tape on Friday afternoon. Um, how much longer do Democrats, is the patience running out? Are you getting antsy? Well, look, uh, you know, personally, I've never felt that Tim Ryan is going to run. Um, and it's largely because uh, he, I don't think he's going to want to give up a job that pays $175,000 a year as a member of Congress, and which he can keep for as long as he wants, to take a flyer on a governor's race that he may very well lose. And if he did lose, who's going to pay him $175,000 a year in Youngstown, Ohio? I mean, that, uh, so, uh, but I also think, I mean, Ryan has the same problem that Renacci does, or frankly, any member of Congress does, and that is outside your district, nobody knows who you are. And it takes, a, it takes a lot of money. Well, but it takes a lot of money to 
get known, and, and that is always the problem. Jackie, uh, we keep hearing about that money, but if the Democrats have a chance of winning the governor's office here and also helping guide drawing of congressional districts in 2020, the money will come, right, from nationals for to help the Democrat, wouldn't you say? I mean, I th it depends a lot on what's happening in the other states, yeah. and we saw this with with uh, Rob Portman's matchup against Ted Strickland. Everyone thought that, you know, Ted was going to get some more of that national money, and then it just seemed that e even early on that other states needed it more. I mean, there's only a, a limited pot of resources there. And it comes down to the candidate. It line. comes down to the candidate, and it honestly, right now, especially looking at what the Democratic field looks like, it really comes down to how is Donald Trump doing yeah. in two years, um, because uh, uh, it's taken a long time for a clear front runner to sh to show up, and Democrats are getting antsy. You know, um, that that's what that's what we hear, and so. Um, uh, depending, they've got candidates who could win, but those people are going to need Donald Trump to be struggling just to get started. All right, get to our last topic. Columbus could see a larger city council where members would live in districts spread around the city, but <coughs> there's a catch. The Columbus Charter Review Committee has recommended changing city council under the proposal. City council would go from seven members to nine, but each member would live in a different district. But here's that catch. The members must run citywide. And when there was a vacancy, appointees would not be allowed to run immediately. What is not in the plan? Any limits on donations or spending in the campaigns. The next step in this process is city council approval, <coughs> and then it would go to the city voters. Dale Butlin, can you serve two masters? Can you be a district city council member but have to look for votes citywide? Well, yeah, you can, but I don't think that's the main problem uh, here as I see it. First of all, I do think it's important probably that we expand the number of council members from the current seven to at least ten. We're a big city now. We're just under a million people now in the city. The problem I have with this saying that people will live in specific districts but run citywide is that it gives a big advantage to people who have built good name ID citywide, probably either through politics or through some other walk of life. Now you can have someone in the community, in the neighborhood, who's very well known there, but doesn't have name ID citywide. So I think this is gonna make it harder for new people to break into the system. Republicans are on the outside looking in. Yeah. Does this help? Them? Uh, no, yeah, but that's a bigger <laughs> issue for a bigger conversation. But uh, this proposal is a hot mess, Mike. You can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. Why is Andy Ginther and Zach Klein so afraid to let the people vote? You know, Democrats continue to complain about redistricting reform and getting rid of gerrymandering, but yet in city council here, one of the largest cities in the nation, 15th largest city, the mayor and Zach Klein are afraid to let the people vote for their own representative. Why is that? Well, the argument is that you have, if you have too many district representatives, Jackie, that they don't see the big picture, that they it becomes nimby, not in my backyard, or very parochial in, in their view of city policy. And that's what the that's what the well, I think there's the better ways to, to maybe solve that problem mm -hmm. than the it, it is very odd that you would be representing a district that didn't necessarily vote for you. I mean right. it's possible that that in your district you you lost against yeah. you know your head to head person that you're you're running against. And I think this is a weak compromise. Um, and I think Mike is right. Uh, I think that they are afraid that that people are, you, you were surprised. <laughs> no, I think Mike is right. I think they are afraid to give, let people, uh, you know, let the citizens really, really craft this. And uh, I think it also causes problems uh, with going with what Dale said, and it, it won't encourage new blood to get into the council. And who's going to be drawing those district lines in the future? That, that, that was a criticism last summer, Christy, is we don't get to see the district lines. We don't, we haven't, we don't see the lines in this proposal either. Maybe we will by the time, by the time voters get it, but I kind of doubt it. What we know is where the current um, people who are serving live, and they, they don't live in any sort of uh, reasonably distributed uh, pattern. And uh, so it does raise a lot of the questions that, that, that Dale brought up. Honestly, it, so Dale doesn't like it, and <coughs> Mike doesn't like it. There's probably some problems with this program, <laughs> so or this proposal. So. But, I, but I have a good compromise. <laughs> How okay. about the Democrats will promise not to gerrymander anything in the city of Columbus if the Republicans will promise not to gerrymander the congressional districts or the state house districts. What do you say? Is that a deal? Well, call your congressman. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he won't take my calls. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no limit on campaign spending. We had donations last year, fifty thousand dollars to the city council race or at the mayor's race. Dale, yeah, that's that's just that's that's a lot of money. Yeah, it is. And, and uh, look, I, I've, uh, I've always believed and, and have said on this show and others that I think disclosure is really important. I personally think there's far too much money in politics. But, you know, one of the problems is I remember when I worked for John Glenn, we wanted to go to public 
fi financing the campaigns. But here's the problem. When you put that issue to the poll to the voters in a poll, yeah. they say, oh, no, I don't want my tax money going to those jokers. Well, you know, if you don't like private money in campaigns and, and you don't like public money, you, you yeah. have a problem because it's going to be one or the other. We're all checking that box and not <laughs> checking that <laughs> box on our tax returns right now. <laughs> Let's get to our weekly off-the-record parting shots. Uh, Mike, go to Dr. Strip first. When we stay on city council in the past 60 days, they took bold steps to give free tampons away, sort of create sanctuary cities, give $68 million uh, tax break to Easton, which obviously doesn't need it. And now this week, the Columbus Dispatch reports that they're going to ban conversion therapy, which the paper says is not even an issue in our town. What is city council doing? My God, that, so who, who's going to hold them accountable? Dale. On Tuesday, President Trump will address a joint session of Congress. Will his speech be positive and uplifting, or will it be a reprise of his dark American carnage inaugural speech? What he should be talking about is the need to unite the country and bring people together, how he's going to improve the lives of regular people. Will, will he do it? I'm not holding my breath. Chrissy. I got to uh, meet in person uh, for the first time this week, Jim Renacci, who's the one one guy that we didn't talk much about today. Yeah. I just wanted to let uh, viewers know to keep their eye on him and not count him out. He is really serious about this, and I was actually really impressed um, with uh, the way that he handled a lot of issues. I think he's a serious candidate. And Jackie. I just have to put a plug in for a special project that Cleveland.com is working on this year where we've dispatched reporters around the state to kind of get the pulse of the state as we move forward under uh, President Trump. and. And uh, so you can check it out at cleveland.com. It's called Ohio, Ohio Matters. Ohio Matters. Yeah, it's really, really, really interesting reading. Uh, don't forget, next Thursday, we're doing another Politics in a Pint event in the Columbus on the Record special. We'll be at Seven Sons Brewing on North 4th in an Italian Village, Thursday night at 5.30. Come on down. It's a great time. This is the fourth time we've done it. We're taping next week's show there, so you can maybe be on TV. Uh, details at WOSU.org. Also, the WOSU and Columbus on the Record Facebook pages. That's Columbus on the Record for this week. Thanks to our crew and our panel. I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.